to me, save that thou art, thou my best thought by day or by night, waking or sleeping, thy presence my I cry out your name, your holy name, Lord. Oh. Riches I need not, no man's empty. Thou mine inheritance now and always Thou and Thou only first in my heart High King of Heaven, my treasure I cry out your name, your holy name. Oh. Hi, King. My victory won, may I reach heaven's joy, O oh, bright heaven's sun, heart of my own heart, whatever befall, still be my vision, O oh, ruler of all, still be Restore what was lost on the way. And be thou my hope in the waiting. In the Good evening, everyone. Welcome to worship on this beautiful Lord's Day. We have a joy to come together tonight as God's people called out of the world into His presence to worship Him. Let's stand together as we hear God's call to worship tonight. I'm going to read this call from Psalm 96. This is a, a glorious uh, psalm of praise to the Lord. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless His name. Tell of His salvation from day to day. Declare His glory among the nations, His marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. 
For all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. What a privilege it is for us to draw near to him tonight. Let's begin the service in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight in this time that we have dedicated to the worship of you, the one true God. You know our hearts, and with humility and with joy, we come before you tonight to bring you praise, to worship at your footstool, to exalt your name through all the earth, to sing and bless your holy name. Help us even tonight to sing of your salvation from day to day and declare among the nations the marvelous works you have done. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. God greets you, brothers and sisters, tonight with these words, grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and Christ Jesus our Lord, amen. We're going to sing a few songs this evening. We're going to be thinking about the ascension of Jesus and His work, especially in that capacity as our great high priest. So, these psalms that we're going to sing uh, key into these ideas. This first one, Psalm 24, the last two stanzas, uh, as if a great king is entering his city after a victory. Let's sing out in praise to the Lord. victory over the grave, and then we think of his ascension into the heavenly city, and to see those gates, as it were, opened up to him, hailing that king, the king of glory. Well, our second psalm, Psalm 110, is another beautiful psalm that highlights especially the priestly and the kingly work of Jesus, and we're going to be thinking of this uh, in our study tonight from Hebrews chapter 7 which quotes this psalm. So let's sing praise from Psalm 110.
has sworn and from his oath he never will depart. Of the order of Melchizedek, a priest thou ever art. Truly we have reason for confidence tonight even to draw near. We do that tonight even as we approach the throne of grace. Uh, In our evening prayer we have much to be thankful for, much to lift to the throne uh, in terms of our prayers for one another and for our brothers and sisters in Christ throughout the world. So let's join our hearts together and lift up our prayers to him. Our Father, tonight we come, we come with boldness and confidence to find help in our time of need, that we might indeed find help because we have a Savior who sits enthroned and even now intercedes for us, his people. Father, what a joy, what a privilege it is for us today on, on a day of rest to gather in the beginning of the day and towards the end of the day to worship with your saints, to lift high your name, to reflect on all the wonderful things that are ours in Christ Jesus, that we might join our voices with those throughout the world and throughout the ages singing your praises of the wonderful works of creation as we look around in this beautiful spring season. We see these late rains and the, the life which it brings bursting forth from the earth and the beautiful flowers and the birds and we're reminded that you are the God who has made all of this. You are the one from whom our help comes and you are the one who sustains this great world. Help us even to sing your praises as we see the intricacy, the beauty, the rhythm, the the life which we see teeming in all the earth. That all of this comes by the word of your power. And all of it continues to exist because of your sustaining power. Help us to truly give you the glory that's due to you for this beautiful creation. But we also come tonight in light of the great salvation that you have accomplished by Christ and now have sealed to us by your Holy Spirit. We thank you that we, though sinners we were, undeserving, yet you have heaped upon us your love, your tender mercies, your grace. You have forgiven us for our sins. You have washed us clean. You have cleansed our consciences. You have clothed us in the righteousness of Christ that we might even be called your children, children of the living God, and given us the privilege, even in Christ, to draw near, to approach your heavenly throne of grace, even in this hour. Father, we we pray that even more and more each day, And week by week, and as we grow as Christians, that we would see these great privileges that are ours in Christ Jesus. That we reflect on what's ours already now, and as we think to the future of what will be ours in the life to come, when Christ comes and makes all things new, When there will be no more crying or tears, no more pain or suffering, where the gates of that eternal city will be open and there will be no evil. Father, we long for that day. And we ask when or how long. And yet you've called us to be watchful, to be diligent and to keep our lives from sin. So we ask your help even tonight in this, Lord that we would not be so comfortable on this earth, that we think we have everything we need, but that you would, in fact, wean our hearts from this earth, that we would long for things above, even as we're seated with Christ in the heavenlies, being united to him in faith. Father, we ask that, that you would continue to work in our lives, that we would look to you, for all the things that we do need, that we would praise and thank you for all that we have, and that we would continue to pray for all things future. 
Father, we ask tonight for your blessing upon the reading and the preaching of your word. Would you open it to us as you breathed it out initially that it might be written down and scripturated for us, that now you would illuminate that our, our hearts, our minds might see clearly the beauties and the glories held there for us, that we might grasp the work of Christ for us, that we would see this great place which he holds in your plan of redemption, that we would see the blessings that are ours even in him, even tonight, as he continues to intercede on our behalf. Father, we ask that you continue to bless your church. We ask your blessing upon Cornerstone even, that this would be a church where your word is cherished and treasured, and that as it's read and preached, your people are built up, conformed to the image of Christ, where those who were dead in sins and transgressions are raised up to new life. We pray that we would be a church that, through prayer and other means of support, is actively engaged in proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ here and abroad. Father, would you use our efforts to to proclaim the name of Christ, to bear witness faithfully to the work of Christ, to grow your church, both in number, yes, but also in the depth of our faith, and the understanding of the riches of ours in Christ. Father, we pray for the needs of your people here. We ask that you would stoop to comfort those who are burdened, who are laid low, who need your tender mercies. We pray for those dealing especially with pressing health concerns, Father, you know their their thoughts and the comfort that they need from your word, that you are the one who sustains, who brings these things upon them, that they might trust you, that their faith would be strengthened and refined, and that in the midst of these challenges of life, that, that they would look to you, but also that you would grant healing, O Lord. Give the doctors, the physicians, the the technicians, and the therapists wisdom and skill as they treat these brothers and sisters. Father, we pray for Will and for Dave and their upcoming procedures. We pray for, for many others who battle constant and chronic pain. We pray for those who care for aging parents or for little children. Father, give grace upon grace that we might selflessly, sacrificially love those who are in our lives, that we might be like Christ to them, that as they look to the love that we show, that they might see the greater love of Christ, where he gave his life for sinners. Father, we pray for the relationships, especially between husbands and wives. We pray that this would be a relationship carefully cultivated, protected, and cherished, that we would see in your word what a privilege this relationship is, that it runs through from Genesis to Revelation to point beyond itself to the relationship of Christ and its church. And yet, so show the the significance even of this earthly relationship. Be with husbands, we pray, that they would be strengthened to be loving leaders in the home, to serve sacrificially, to lead boldly, to love selflessly. Be with the wives, that they might be as you've created them to be, as helpers who love and respect their husbands, whom you've placed as heads of the household, and that each in their roles that you've given might represent and reflect the role of Christ and of his church, respectively. Father, tonight as we think about Christ, we ask that we might see 
this great place in which he has even now been welcomed into that heavenly holy of holies. And that as he sits at your, sits at your right hand, living forever, interceding for us, that we would praise your name for this continuing work. Bless your word, we ask tonight, in Jesus' name, amen. Before we turn to the scriptures, if you take the catechism questions out, week by week, we've been working our way through these as as we pair these up with the Apostles' Creed. We confess that in the morning services, and then right now we are in this section of the catechism that keys in on these different statements of the Apostles' Creed. We're up to that point where we confess that he ascended into heaven. And this Lord's Day asks some questions about what that means. And I mentioned this morning uh, the context of the Reformation where these were fiery debates concerning the bodily or the human nature of Christ and his divine nature. We don't have time tonight to go into all of that, but... If you're working through these, keep that in mind, that in the time, these were furious debates. How can it be that Jesus is present now among us, if not physically? Well, the catechism, based on the scripture, teaches us it's by his spirit, by his divine nature. He is here even now. But I want to focus just on two questions this evening. And it's the first and the last one here, 46 and 49. And I, I want to read these responsibly with you tonight. If you have these at hand, uh, let's look at these two questions. First, what do you mean by saying he ascended into heaven? That Christ, while his disciples watched, was lifted up from the earth into heaven and will be there for our good until he comes again to judge the living and the dead. This is pretty clear teaching throughout the New Testament that the disciples saw just that. And the angel said, what are you looking for? (laughs) He'll return this same way. But then let's drop down to question 49. How does Christ's ascension into heaven benefit us? First, he pleads our cause in heaven in the presence of his Father. Second, we have our own flesh in heaven, a guarantee that Christ, our head, will take us, his members, to himself in heaven. Third, he sends his Spirit to us on earth as a further guarantee. By the Spirit's power, We make the goal of our lives not earthly things, but the things above where Christ is, sitting at God's right hand. These questions are so instructive for us, but we can only choose selectively. So I wanted to key in especially on these two and and even then on these aspects that Jesus is even now in the heavens and is there for our good until he comes again. And that he is there pleading our cause in the presence of his Father. As we think about that, I've noted recently the idea of the benefits of Christ's completed work. Maybe you've picked up on that in the last several weeks. uh, This theme through these questions, what, what benefit, what benefit, what benefit, that kind of chorus that runs through these questions. And so... Once again, we're thinking about the benefits, and in this regard, the ascension benefits as we think about Christ ascended. Well, let's turn to the scriptures. We're going to be looking tonight at Hebrews chapter 7. We don't have time to look at the whole chapter, but if you wanted a quick summary, The author of Hebrews is basically comparing and contrasting the Levitical priesthood, that is, of Aaron and all of his descendants, to Jesus, which is modeled on the the order of Melchizedek, 
If you remember that story from Genesis and what we sang about in Psalm 110, well, there's the quick of it. We'll pick up our reading in Hebrews 7, verse 11. You should find this on page 1004. As we think about the ascended Christ, even now in his role as our great high priest. Now, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek, rather than one named after the order of Aaron? For when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. For the one of whom these things are spoken belonged to another tribe, from which no one has ever served at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, and in connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. This becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest not on the basis of a legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. For it is witnessed of him, you are a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness, for the law made nothing perfect. But on the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. And it is not without an oath. For those who formerly became priests were made such without an oath. But this one was made a priest with an oath by the one who said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. And now our, our focus this evening, these next three verses. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the othermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins, and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered himself up. For the law appoints men in their weakness as high priests, but the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. And again, our our focus this evening is on verses 23 through 25. May the Lord add his blessing to his word tonight. Lawyers seem to make a big deal about their record. If they have been serving in the courts for some time, they might boast about the percentage of cases that they have won. Whether they are a defender or a prosecutor, they might relish that their record is impeccable. And even better if they have won all of their cases, a 100% success rate. Well, I talk about lawyers in the first place because, you know, this is what all the dramas are about, right? There's so many books and stories about lawyers and the drama in the courtroom scene. And yet the work of our Lord Jesus Christ isn't all that much different as he sits enthroned in the heavenly courts. And we might say his record is 100% 
He's not lost a single case, even as he intercedes for his people. And this is a glorious thought for us tonight as we think about the work of the glorified, ascended Christ Jesus. Having made that final once for all sacrifice, covering the sins of his people, now even he continues his work, interceding for you and me, pleading our cause before the throne of the Father. And the scriptural promise is that he will lose none of whom the Father has given him. Yes, 100% success rate. He's never lost a single case. Well, this is to our joy, isn't it? That we have a great high priest who has indeed ascended into the heavens as those heavenly gates were opened to him. As we sang in Psalm 24, the great conquering king seated on the throne and yet even there sits as the great priest king as we see in Psalm 110, to whom the Lord has sworn you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. We don't have time tonight to go into all the background of Melchizedek and what all this means for our passage tonight. And yet when we think about Christ as our advocate, as the one who intercedes for us, his people. It's helpful to think about a number of things concerning his priesthood. And part of that is a contrast. The first point we're going to be thinking about tonight is the contrast with a perishing priesthood. You see in our passage the, the Levitical or the, the priesthood of Aaron and his sons. It was a perishing priesthood priesthood. Then in the second place, I want you to see that we have a permanent priesthood in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, I should maybe be more clear. He has a permanent priesthood. And then finally, that as we think about this, he makes a perfect intercession. A perishing priesthood, a permanent priesthood, and a perfect intercession. I want you to think about these things in particular as the book of Hebrews implores Christians to press on, to run the race, to not fall as it were in the wilderness, but to enter that rest, that eternal rest of God. And in this journey, in this great wilderness, we have one who intercedes on our behalf. And he lives forever to do just that, that we might draw near. Maybe you heard that language, drawing near, throughout this passage, and, and it's written throughout the book of Hebrews, that we even today draw near to the Lord God Almighty through Christ Jesus. And what a privilege that is for us to be able to draw near to God because that way has been opened up to us through Christ Jesus. Well, as we think about these things, let's look at the first place at a perishing priesthood. As Westerners and especially as, as Americans, we're used to people taking office and then leaving office. In fact, that's what we want, isn't it? We don't want people to stay in office for very long. Because power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And so we're happy when someone, especially if they're doing a bad job, leaves office. However, that's not the picture that we see in Scripture, is it? Scripture holds out for us, especially in the Old Testament, three offices, prophet, priest, and king. And it highlights that if one serves well in this, that it would be a good thing if they would continue in their office. And yet, when it comes to the old office of the priesthood, Aaron's line had a line of succession, one after another, after another, and another, actually 83 of them. Why? Because they all died. It's a perishing priesthood. And this is what the author of Hebrews is helping us to see, 
Jesus' priesthood is better because he lives forever. But you don't understand that until it's set against a perishing priesthood in which one after another and then on it goes for 83 of them dies. You see in verse 23, the former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. And it doesn't take us very long in the Old Testament to grasp this, does it? Whereas even before they reach the promised land, Aaron dies. You catch this in Numbers chapter 20. Miriam dies first, and then Aaron. As they journey from Kadesh, the people of Israel, the whole congregation comes to Mount Hor. And then we hear this, let Aaron be gathered to his people, for he shall not enter the land that I have given to the people of Israel, because he rebelled against my commandment at the waters of Meribah. Take Aaron and Eleazar his son, and bring them up the mount, and strip Aaron of his garments, that is, his, his high priestly garments, and put them on Eleazar his son. And Aaron shall be gathered to his people and shall die there. And then we go a little bit further on and we get to Joshua. And we see Eliezer the priest die and his position given to his son, Phinehas. Josephus, the the Jewish historian, tells us that from Aaron until the destruction, the final destruction of the temple in A.D. 70, some 83 high priests served in office. How many we see there, one after another, because they were prevented from serving longer by death. This is a great contrast for us, isn't it? Again, we, we expect this. But in terms of Scripture, this is, this is lamentable. But it's not overcomable, if I can say that. Because Jesus lives forever. Whereas death prevented these Old Testament, these Levitical or Aaronic high priests from continuing in their office, Jesus lives forever. So that in contrast to those 83 or so who died We have the one, Jesus, who lives forever and holds this office office everlastingly then. And so this brings us to briefly to the second point where Jesus has a permanent priesthood. And the author of Hebrews has gone to some lengths to emphasize this change, a quite dramatic change where the whole Old Testament is built on on Aaron's line and this Levitical priesthood. And yet he says, you shouldn't be surprised about this change of priesthood. Yes, the old came by law, but the new by an oath. And this new is spoken of again in the Psalms, in Psalm 110. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Again, Melchizedek is this kind of murky figure, right? In a book like Genesis where you have line after line of people who lived and died. And then the next generation who lived and died. Melchizedek comes and goes without any record of his birth and without any record of his death. It doesn't mean he didn't come from anywhere and it doesn't mean he didn't die. But the way Genesis presents it to us is that he's kind of this mysterious figure with no genealogy and no death. And it's like that that Jesus comes as a great high priest, a priest who can serve and will serve forever. And a priest who himself has made this perfect sacrifice so he doesn't have to make one after another. And so it is this permanent priesthood that we think about tonight as Jesus made that sacrifice on the cross, was buried, was raised, 
and then ascended into the heavens. And while so much of that work is finished, he doesn't put away this office of the priesthood. He continues in it, continuing to serve permanently. You think about examples of permanence. We, we say, especially now, nothing lasts forever, right? That's just the, the context in which we live. We live in a world of disposable things. And yet, even in contrast to those kinds of things, when we bump up against something old or something that's to last forever, that's hard for us to grasp. And yet, this is the whole point of what the author of Hebrews is saying. This is how remarkable it is that Jesus holds this office forever. He continues as this great high priest forever. There's great comfort in that, isn't there? That the one who has made intercession now lives everlastingly? You catch that a little bit in, in the first question and answer that we looked at tonight. What do you mean by saying he ascended into heaven? That Christ, while his disciples watched was lifted up from the earth into heaven and will be there for our good until he comes again to judge the living and the dead. Jesus' life continues even now. Permanently. Forever. Again, that's something our minds feebly cannot grasp. And yet when we see it in contrast to the the death of the Old Testament priests and our continuing need for someone to be our great high priest, what great comfort we have tonight that Jesus is there always as our priest. One end then finally, as Jesus holds this permanent priesthood, he makes perfect intercession. As you all know, the Christian life is filled with challenges, fraught with difficulty, not only because we live in an earth in which there is still sin, which we contribute to regularly, in which we're sinned against, which our own bodies cry out. The author of Hebrews recognizes these things, recognizes that the Christian life is difficult. And so the author of Hebrews, as he writes throughout the book, balances on the one hand stern warnings for Christians to persevere, drilling into to key aspects in which we might be tempted to turn away from Christianity to turn our backs on the the work of Christ, even for earthly things. But then balances those stern warnings with great comfort, with blessed comfort. And this is one of those things tonight before us. The blessing of a holy priest who intercedes for his people. You ever think about someone who gets you, someone who knows you and can speak for you? We think often about advocates these days, whether it's someone facing medical challenges and someone needing to advocate for them to make sure their case goes all the way through, or in other areas of life where someone needs someone to take up the charge for them Well, how much more then, as Christians, as we look to Christ as our advocate, as the one who intercedes for us, can we be comforted tonight? As we think about this tremendous benefit of Christ's ascension. Think for a moment, if Christ didn't ascend to the heavens, if he wasn't seated at the right hand of the Father, how much different this might look for us? 
And yet there he is. And we have the promise, even today, that Christ is our great intercessor. Before we drill into that any deeper, there's another aspect to this in verse 25 that I want to touch on. And as Jesus is there for us as our great high priest, there's something else that the author of Hebrews highlights. He says, consequently, because Jesus is this great high priest and he continues forever, he says, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him. Think about this salvation that's pictured for us here. Again, earlier in the book, the author of Hebrews draws our attention to those who fell in the wilderness, who didn't get to enter into his rest. Or maybe others who just drifted away like a boat in the harbor, not without being anchored. It wasn't that they were trying to drift away, they just weren't anchored, and so they drifted away. But here he says, you, you have one who is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God. And then you think about this theme, right, of of running the race, completing the race set before us. And it's because we have Jesus who is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near. And that's what I mentioned earlier, right? This theme of drawing near to the Lord through Christ Jesus. Let me just highlight a couple aspects here as we think about that idea of of drawing near to God. You have heard me speak probably too many times about this theme where Adam and Eve were driven from God's presence And the rest of the scriptures is really playing out how does humanity come and draw near to God once more. And we see it's only through sacrifice. And then only finally through the finished sacrifice of Christ. And so this whole center section of Hebrews is bound up with that goal to draw near. To come before the very presence of God based on Jesus' priestly work. Bookending or enveloping this idea, we we read these two verses. First, Hebrews 4, verse 16. Well, I'll back it up to verse 14. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Now catch this. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. This introduces Jesus' high priestly work. But then by the end of of this section in chapter 10, almost the same language is used once again. Chapter 10, verse 19, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the holy places, again, the idea of drawing near, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he has opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. How is it that we will finally draw near? It's because we have a high priest who even now intercedes on our behalf. 
He is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near. Why? Because he always lives to make intercession for us. You think about this intercessory work of Jesus tonight. How he pleads our cause, how he advocates, advocates for us. It's a beautiful theme, isn't it? But it doesn't just pop up here. Some of the brothers have been studying Jesus' upper room discourse and have just recently gotten to Jesus' high priestly prayer. And here we have that, that picture of Christ as a great high priest interceding for those the Father has given to him. You read through that and you see the earnestness which with Christ prays for his people. Or you think of how Jesus spoke to Peter. You think of Luke chapter 22. How Peter would have been sifted. But Jesus prayed for him. Or you might think of Romans chapter 8. Where Paul in great joy bursts out, as it were, in this great chapter of comfort, delving the depths of God's everlasting love, contemplating if there's anything in the world that might drive us from that love, bursts out with this. Who's to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Do you see this beautiful reality, saints of God? That even now, the Lord Jesus Christ in his office of our great high priest makes intercession for his people. That we may finally on that last day, receive that final salvation as we draw near to God. That anything that would inhibit that or prevent that or get in the way of that, if there could be such a thing, Christ is there interceding on our behalf. This is perhaps this first benefit that we see tonight that he pleads our cause in heaven in the presence of our Father. Our whole life long, Jesus, the great high priest, is praying for you. And his prayers are heard by the Father because the Father loves him. And the Father delights in his Son who has saved his people. Have you ever thought of such a benefit that Christ has won for you? That even now, he intercedes for you. That he might save you to the uttermost. That you may enter that heavenly rest on that last day. That's the glorious hope of the Christian life. Amen. Our Father, we thank you so much that we have a great high priest who even now intercedes on our behalf, that indeed he is able to save to the uttermost even a weak and faltering people. We rejoice that we can have such hope and confidence that until that day we might persevere. Father, would your name Would you, our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be praised in our lives, even as we think of this great benefit of Christ's ascension. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, we close this service tonight singing of of this work of Christ as we stand together and sing before the throne of God. Listen to this first line before we sing it. Before the throne of God above. I have a strong and perfect plea. 
a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. Let's sing to the praise of our God. Saints of God, you for whom our Lord Jesus intercedes even now, look up and receive your God's parting blessing. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in you that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Grace be with you all. Amen. Before the throne of God above I have a strong and perfect plea the great high priest whose name is love whoever lives and pleads for me my name is graven on his hands my name is written on his heart
Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within upward I look and see him there who made an end of all my sin Oh, because a sinless Savior died my sinful soul is counted free for God the just is satisfied Perfect spotless righteousness, the great unchangeable I am, the King of glory and of grace. One in himself I cannot die, my soul is purchased by his blood, my life is hid with Christ on my Savior and my God, with Christ my Savior.